Love podcasts, hate nonsense. It's the Politics Show podcast, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> the applause really sounds muted, particularly when, <laughs> when you're not there and you're applauding here and because you're here, Ed and Ava aren't here and Sean's not here. It is really just two people clapping in, yeah. in, a, in a big room. <laughs> There's no one to like laugh at the jokes either. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> Will there be any jokes in this episode? Oh, well, it's quite a serious episode. It so is quite a serious episode, not. Laura. Um, how are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Yeah, very well. Very, very well. Um, fresh fresh off setting the world to rights at Wilderness Festival. How was that? This weekend. Yeah, it was good. Uh, some disappointed members of the audience who thought they were getting a full-on podcast. Oh, no. And, and just got me. Um, so they're, they're a bit gutted about that. But um, a, lot of, a lot of anxiety in the tent really about what we're going to be talking about today really yeah was yeah, there yeah. much discussion there of what was going on there was well i did two i did two things they do a uh they do like a they call it people's question time where it's like a debate eight people on the stage you kind of take questions from the audience it was it was uh moderated compared shall we say archie manners the youtuber um from josh and archie and it was like me, uh, Matt Shea was there, you know, the, the Vice guy who did mm-hmm. the Tate oh, documentary. Yeah, he's really good. Yeah, he is. He's really, really good. Um, John Sweeney, Antoinette, Fer- Antoinette Fernandez, the Green candidate who stood against Diane Abbott, people mm-hmm. like that. There are philosophers, poets, uh, Hayden Prowse, mm. Serena Kaczynski, all sorts of people. And um, there, were, there were questions about this. And then when I did my interview, people were also asking sort of follow-ups about you know what do we do how do we respond mm-hmm. what's the appropriate mechanism for combating um the far right so mm-hmm. people are worried about it yeah people are interested in it and i was kind of well we'll get into it over the course mm-hmm. of, of the episode but it was i was sort of saying that the, the horse has kind of bolted at this point do you think <laughs> yeah so I, there, I was reading a um dan evans who wrote um so it's fucking, I've literally just finished reading it. I've brought it up on the podcast already. God, this is embarrassing. Um, I read Dan, I was reading Dan Evans' book recently and then following him on Twitter and he tweeted this old interview um, from a couple of like anarchist, anti-fascists mm-hmm. called, uh, who were in like Red Action and, and others. Um, and they were talking about that essentially if you get to the point where the far right is mobilizing en masse in your communities, you've already lost. Uh, because the step before that was to like violently shut them down mm-hmm. when they're sort of, if it's like one bloke on a street corner parroting anti Semitic conspiracy theories and you beat him up, or I don't know, back in the day, there's like a national front mm-hmm. um, newspaper stall and you smash up their stall and you send them running out of town. Um, that is already a failure because you should have been organizing in your community before that yeah, and not organizing in the way that, and this I think is kind of where we get to with current responses to extreme politics, Mm -hmm. that like mass protests, online petitions, um, clicktivism, Mm -hmm. essentially very good at talking to people that already agree with you. Yes. Media spectacle. but in terms of actually on the ground, nuts and bolts in your community, combating, let's say, well, yeah, the far right, uh-huh. whether that's Tommy Robinson supporters, um, whether it's like, you know, l- real, when we're verging on kind of like fascists, right? We're talking about various disparate groups that might include Britain First, Patriotic Alternative. If these people are out leafleting in your towns, if they're able to hold meetings that bring tens or hundreds of people and then eventually, sort of mobilizing in this way you failed yeah because your message your politics uh hasn't been hasn't been disseminated you you, you've at that point it's almost too late to try and speak to these people right because Mm -hmm. they've now been they've now been radicalized Mm -hmm. um which wasn't exactly a cheery message Mm -hmm. to to bring to the forum at wilderness um but was kind of how i feel about it maybe we'll talk Mm -hmm. about that more it's quite um like what what you're saying is quite like, do you know Karl Popper's tolerance paradox? No. It's the idea that in liberal democracies, um, there is a paradox at the centre of them, that you have to be, to have a tolerant society, 
you have to be intolerant of intolerant people. Otherwise, because people that hold fundamentally intolerant views, like people that are neo-fascist, like people that are fundamentally racist, can't participate in a liberal society because they fundamentally want to dismantle the liberal yes. society. So ironically, or paradoxically, you have to be intolerant of those groups. Well, that's, uh, yeah. So, I mean, even within just the idea of tolerance, right, it's, um, it's paradoxical because if, if you're just going for like, mill then it's accept, accepting that which you reject with limits mm -hmm. so you, if you're already talking about accepting things that you reject like how do those two things sit together right because mm -hmm. by definition if you reject it how can you accept it but it within that within that paradigm it's with limits right mm -hmm. we, we we all say we live in a tolerant society we will accept the things that we reject but there is a line yeah and really interestingly it's kind of going what where where do we say the barrier is for intolerance like what is the line beyond which we will no longer accept it and th and this was this w is where i think the most interesting conversation is around this because it relates to political violence mm -hmm. we say that as a society we will tolerate um people who aren't outright fascists so for example reform nigel farage um previous iterations of ukip although in its current guise it's certainly seems to be slipping more towards it, like in an alt-right neo-fascist direction. But we will basically say we will tolerate these people in our society. But I feel like we have such short memories if we're talking about people like Oswald Mosley, if we're talking about uh, literal Nazi sympathisers in Britain, where there was a time where if you stood up and espoused those ideas, there was a very likely chance that you would get jumped in the street, right? Mm -hmm. Because whether it's like young Jewish lads in the East End of London, if you're out there Jew baiting, they will go, do you know what? Um, we've seen the way this goes. We've, we've literally just come out of a war where six million of our brethren were exterminated by people who held those views. There comes a point where we don't go, God, isn't this, isn't this so, um, isn't this rhetoric appalling? Mm -hmm. isn't, isn't this, this, this disgusting, uh, illiberal ideas? Oh, terrible, no place in our society. There's like a dis discursive response, but there has to be a point at which we say, actually, we're no longer going to respond to this. We're no longer going to treat this as an acceptable political idea. We're going to chase these people out mm -hmm. of our towns. Mm -hmm. um, now, there's a, there's a split, isn't there, between kind of like, I guess, liberals and anarchists. This might be slightly reductive. Where liberals will say, well, uh, the state has a monopoly on violence, and so it is. We will we will impose political violence on these people, but it is via the mechanism of mm -hmm. the police, the security mm -hmm. services. Whereas uh, anarchists and people who believe in direct action will say, "We are going to confront these people. We mm -hmm. are going to deal with these people." And 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 the old adage is like, when a guy says, um, "You know where I come from, Nazis get shot," and someone says, "Well, where are you from?" and the guy says, "England," mm -hmm. it's like we've done it before. We'll do it again. And I think that's the interesting conversation here is to what extent are we prepared to, I don't, I'm, I'm using that in like a very generic sense, not like we, you and I, mm -hmm. or we as politics, I mean like as a country, <laughs> um, are we prepared to accept racists? Because that's all it is now at this point, right? And when we'll get into the, 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 the I feel like we've gone, we've, we've like skipped the, <laughs> the news part and we've gone straight to the philosophy part. Oh, this is interesting, part. keep yeah. going. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the like, um, when we have racists, uh, because that's what they are. If you're mm -hmm. if you're attacking, first of all, if you're a, if, if 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 a Muslim had committed some kind of horrific crime and your response was to go and attack a mosque, yeah, you would still be like, well, you're a racist, yeah, because the fact that he's a Muslim has very little to do, if anything, to do, depending on what's happened, with the crime he's committed. But you're stereotyping, you're blaming an entire group of people for the actions of one. You know, it's standard like racism. Mm -hmm. But in this instance, not. Uh, because there is no connection between the person that committed the crime yeah. and the people you're targeting, they, they, like within your own logic, it's, it's a fallacy. So all you're doing is exposing your outright prejudice for a group of people. And we have to say, are we prepared to tolerate people like that on our streets? And actually, increasingly, in recent days, we're seeing people aren't because mm -hmm. people are actually now, there are gangs of vigilantes now roaming mm. British cities attacking these same people. Yeah. Birmingham last night yeah. an example of that okay well let's talk let's talk about last last night and sort of where, where we're up mm. to then in the latest I mean it's sort of day by day right there's more 
more far right demonstrations, more counter violence, more arrests. Um, we're speaking on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. What's the latest? Um, so last night we saw um, far right rioters take um, in Plymouth and Birmingham, and actually I think the use of the word protest throughout the events we've seen across the weekend and carrying into this week has been really interesting. Because um, the, the Times, which is the paper of record, were describing what was happening as far-right protests. Mm. Um, but if you've watched the video I put on Friday, <laughs> um, I spoke to Dr. Stephen Riker in that video and he's kind of probably Britain's foremost um, academic on crowd psychology. And he was talking about how he was appealing to not call these people protesters because they're not protesters. Um, he said to call them protesters was profoundly misleading and it's to discredit a long tradition of legitimate and peaceful protest. And I think it is really important that we make a distinction between what is legitimate protest um, what is a crowd exercising a legitimate right to speech, whether we like it or not what they're saying, versus what is fundamentally violent, criminal riotous mm. behavior okay that's really interesting so i think um i think it's tom witherow the journalist at the times who's been doing a lot of the reporting on this and it's been very very good reporting as well it has to be said protest i want to i want to talk to you about protest and mm -hmm. i want to talk to you about what we might call it instead and whether mm -hmm. and whether we would call it domestic terrorism mm -hmm. but just to stick with the protest line for a second so if we if we try and sort of break slice up the people at these Let's just, again, I was going to say protests and then sort of do, do <laughs> what the conversation we're having. Events, mm. moments, actions, mm. moments of civil disorder. It is interesting. We're kind of finding ourselves like at a loss for the right language to describe it, though. Mm. Like that's, I think that in itself is, is quite interesting. Well, uh, and I'd actually say it's one of the defining, one of the defining ca characteristics. This is Mark, Mark Fisher, right? That's capitalist realism, that essentially we exist in an economic system which so relentlessly tries to degrade um, your, your, your political imagination, but also your vocabulary. So if you don't have it, this, and I guess it's like classic George Orwell, right? That if you don't have the vocabulary to identify yes. the circumstances in which you exist, if you can't diagnose the problem, how on earth do you figure out the prescription, right? Definitely. You, 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 it sort of prevents you from, from responding to it. Mm -hmm. um, so with it, if we were to sort of slice up the people who are attending these events, there's kind of, I think, I think some of them are protesters, right? I think there's, there's like a, a and I, I generally refrain from using this word, but at this point, genuinely fascist um, core, quite limited in terms of the overall number of people that are attending, Far right in their politics, uh, and those are the kind of sort of extremist agitators, if you like. There's a pretty significant, and I've been, I've, I'm not just saying this on a whim. You know, I've, I've reported from far right demonstrations mm -hmm. in the past, and this is generally sort of how it's made up. There's like a there's like a core of, mm -hmm. and at various points it would be either the EDL, the Democratic Football Lads Alliance, like whatever the central organisation is, might be, might be patriotic alternative, might be um, Britain First, and then there's people who genuinely are worried about immigration or um, they might just not be happy about the fact that there's uh, asylum seekers waiting for their, refu claim, their refugee claims to be processed, taking up a hotel. I remember, I think it was in Knowsley, wasn't it, that the, the sort of large parts of the local community, not necessarily motivated by xenophobia or anything like that, they were pissed off that like a hotel that people in the local area often used for weddings mm -hmm. was now full of these people so they couldn't use it for, for what it was typically used for so there are legitimate grievances that can bring people to these places but once they are there and I'm sure you'll talk about this now with uh, what you spoke to Professor Riker about is that once you're part of that crowd whether or not what brought you there in the first place is legitimate concern or grievance about immigration, integration, public services take your pick and I do want to be absolutely fundamentally clear by the way immigration is not some kind of um, settled issue where essentially if you have a concern about it you're a racist or you're, a xeno you're mm -hmm. xenophobic that's not the case at all but once you're there it's kind of irrelevant mm. because the psychology of the crowd kind of takes over at that point it's interesting so I think 
Stephen Riker was kind of pushing back on this idea that you kind of lose your individuality in a group and that you are no longer responsible for your actions. Because mm. at the end of the day, someone, an ordinary person with concerns over a hotel in their local area being used to house migrants, with concerns on the total number of migration into the country, isn't suddenly then just going to start looting a Greg's. Like, <laughs> that's not... Um, even if you're part of a crowd, that's yeah. not something that you're going to do. But something that I thought was interesting is he said, we can tell a lot about the ideology of the group by the symbols they choose to attack. And if you look at where they're attacking now, it's it's mosques, it's asylum hotels. Like these are fundamentally racist, Islamophobic groups mm. being motivated by that. And it doesn't really seem by legitimate questions around immigration yes i saw actually in some telegram channels which will remain nameless um they're now disseminating sort of charities and aid agencies that help um refugees and asylum seekers as mm -hmm. potential yeah. places to target yeah um so again it's the, i guess that's kind of what i'm what i'm driving at right it's like if you did want to protest um immigration and this and it throws up genuine questions about identity and, and nationality, right? Because in relation to Southport, um, the guy's born in Britain, right? So the question becomes, like, to, if, if you have a problem with that, you're sort of giving the game away, right? Because mm -hmm. you're saying that basically anyone who's black British, second generation, third generation, fourth generation, is not British. Yeah. By dint of, by dint of the fact that their parents came from somewhere else yes. in, in, in the first place. And, you know, you don't need to, you don't, need to know Stuart Lee chapter and verse to go you know okay well so so where are we going back to then when we say these are the first Britons yeah. you know is it is it uh the Normans is it mm -hmm. the Anglo-Saxons is it the Beaker people right mm -hmm. it's um history is, is, a, is a story of human movement fluctuations one of the defining things about our modern age and I didn't think of this this is A.A. A. Gill in one of one of the last things he wrote that the defining story of this age is the kind of mass movement of people that no time in history previously didn't just mean immigration like commercial flight you know, your capacity to be in a completely different part of the world in hours mm -hmm. is an extraordinary and novel thing about the modern human experience. So, yes, the pace of change is quite extraordinary right now. But even the most basic understanding of English history will tell you that huge parts of the people that live in this country now are descended from the Normans, mm -hmm. um, the Danes. You know, there's there's all us are our story as an island, in fact, as, as all nations will tell you, is one of conquest, defense, the movement of people. And so if you're going to say, you're not, you're not properly British because your parents came from Rwanda, mm -hmm. but you were born here, it's like, well, I, actually, no, 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 he is. Yeah. He is British. Mm -hmm. um, and they give the game away, right? They give the game away by saying that. You're, just, you're, you're outing yourself as a racist at that point because mm -hmm. essentially what you're saying is, because your parents, yeah. because you're black, because your parents are from mm -hmm. Rwanda, you're not a British person. It's a fundamentally ethnic view of yeah. national identity and nationalism. Um, and I think it's interesting because I think a lot of the commentators, uh, fringe political figures um, that have been stirring this often walk a line between, eth between promoting an ethnic view of nationalism and a civic view of nationalism. Mm. And when it's helpful to them, they jump between the two. Yes. And I think that's... Because then they can always maintain a plausible deniability, a plausible distance from the violence when actually they're fueling it by hopping between the two. Mm. Um, and I think what's interesting as well is that Britain is a very multicultural society and it's actually a very successful multicultural yes. society as Absolutely, well. And I yeah. think when you see the riots like this, it becomes quite easy or reactive to and you've heard we've heard media commentators question it is britain failing at multiculturalism and you want to say no it's not like look at team gb look at our politicians like we are fundamentally a very successful multicultural society and mm. um, but th there was quite an interesting piece in unheard and i can't remember who wrote it now um, about Belfast. no it, it was about um it was about britain as a multi-ethnic society and kind right. of questioning constructions of English identity and where we failed. And I didn't agree with everything. Um, I didn't agree with everything in it, but one of the things that he did 
mention is this lack of language from the left. Um, is the one you sent to me yesterday? It is. Aris. It's Aris Rusinos. That's who wrote it. And I thought that was so interesting because when, when br multiculturalism is succeeding, we just don't need to talk about it. It's a good thing. But then when we see ruptures in that, like we have with this, the left kind of struggles to articulate what's going on because it hasn't managed to formulate the language or it just hasn't had to think about it. Mm, yeah, that, I think that's um, a really, really good point, right? The Economist mm -hmm. um, ran a piece, I think it was quite recently, basically arguing that, you, I mean, the examples you gave there could be could be sort of undermined as anecdotal, right? Where it's like, or tokenistic, where it's like, okay, we've got, we've got, um, and I'm not saying they are, you know, uh, black British athletes, um, people of South Asian heritage in Downing Street until recently. But actually when you dig into the data, and I'm just doing this off my head so I don't have it to mm -hmm. hand, but go and look for this Economist piece. Mm -hmm. I think it's about integration and multiculturalism. And basically if you look at the metrics of um, educational attainment, um, financial attainment, that compared to our European neighbors, Britain mm -hmm. is quite far ahead mm -hmm. when it comes to first generation immigrants and how they perform and how, what they contribute to the economy when they get here. Exactly. Um, and the, essentially the multiculturalism has failed debate mm -hmm. is one that is not based in reality. Yes, it's, exactly. It's, it's essentially a dog whistle for xenophobia. Yes. Um, so, and, and on this point about the language of the left, and uh, particularly in the context of, of nationalism, because it, it came up at the weekend, a question I got asked twice was about what does a um, what does a progressive nationalism look like mm. in place of this? If you are going to adopt, and I want to talk about this more later, we can talk about it now. <laughs> um, in relation, particularly in relation and defined in opposition to Keir Starmer's Labour Party, which at present is the kind of bear moth that's that squats like a toad across. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say the British left, but obviously the argument would go that it's a, it's a centrist political party. But nonetheless, we've had Tom Baldwin and Mark Steers sat at this table and they're kind of the court stenographers, philosophers, right, who are putting forward this idea of, of what that, in, in the book, England's Seven Myths, um, mm -hmm. about what that actually looks like. And they call it ordinary hope, right? Yeah. It's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, they call it ordinary hope. And it's essentially boils down to like muddling through um, the British, the British desire to no matter what's get going on, you know, um, still be back in time for a Sunday roast and a cup of tea. It's like it's Curry's NHS. Isn't it great when the England football team win a penalty shootout? Nationalism. Um, which a progressive liberal nationalism does not make, in my opinion. Like, it's not, it's not good enough to just be able to say, um, and I thought the, I, th I feel bad <laughs> because I didn't say, out of politeness, I didn't say this to when I was interviewed mm. because I still think you should give people a chance, but I didn't think the book was great. Mm. Um, I, didn't, I didn't think it was particularly compelling. I thought it was kind of, it felt like it was having the political discourse of like 10 years ago mm -hmm. about, around the Brexit wars. Um, and, and who we are and, and wasn't particularly based in, in much substance, but, you know, fair opinion and, and all that. And it makes me wonder what a, a good, strong, progressive nationalism <laughs> looks like, because I think they failed to identify it. Yeah. I think um, the, I, I interviewed Zizek, not the most recent time, one before during COVID. And he said something to me in, in a Zoom interview about how essentially his, the patriotism of these people who say we can't assimilate, we can't integrate, we can't handle these communities is essentially a patriotism of fear and anxiety. Because mm -hmm. what the, the, the underneath all of that, what you're essentially saying is my country isn't strong enough to accommodate you. Mm -hmm. Like you coming here threatens my idea of who we are as a country and my idea of what it means to be British. And that instead, if you wanted to look at like Merkel taking a million Syrian refugees, for example, and other nationalities, you say, no, no, my patriotism is one that has a strength of belief in British values as being so robust that it doesn't matter if X number of people come into this country. I believe that we're able to accommodate, integrate, and produce a fruitful, loving society with these people as a part of it. Mm -hmm. And that projecting that strength yeah. and that belief 
can kind of be a basis for an alternative version of nationalism. Mm. You were smiling when I said progressive nationalism. Well, I think that it's interesting because like generally nationalism tends to be a, a conservative um, idea because you tend to define yourself in opposition to another. Like I am what they are not. That's mm -hmm. that's how you, it's binaries and opposites and that's how you define a nation. Specifically if you're using an ethnic form of nationalism. But I think if you look at successful forms of civic nationalism, I think until recently, perhaps, until the kind of dissolution of the SNP that we've seen, I would have argued that Scotland was quite a good example of a civic and progressive form of nationalism. But I wonder if that was just perhaps because the other that we were defining ourselves against was a conservative-led England. Mm. And I wonder if that's why we were able to have a more, at least while that held together, we could have quite a civic, quite a progressive form of nationalism. Mm. It's, but it's, it's not good enough, though, is it, to just define yourself in opposition to something? Like, it, it can work if you're, like, trying to motivate a group of people into doing a thing. You mm -hmm. can say, like, we are not X, we are going to be Y. Mm -hmm. But it kind of demonstrates the, the hollowness or how shallow that is. Mm -hmm. if, if, in, if, your, you know, if your theory is correct, that essentially it's defined in opposite to, mm -hmm. to conservative Englishness, that when that ceases to be an electoral force that it then falls apart you have to question what the actual strength of it right yes um i don't i've been thinking there's an interesting moment at wilderness as well where um they said like who would who in this tent would would be proud to fly an england flag and it was me and one other guy in the whole crowd who put our hands <laughs> up and and hayden kind of let into me on the stage and was like really you put an england flag up I've got a fucking England flag. I've got yeah. an England flag with the Birmingham City logos in each of the four yeah. quadrants. Like, I don't know. It's I'm. I'm not saying like I'm going to become this person that like figures out what mm -hmm. a left wing um, nationalism looks like in this country. But I, uh, I don't think the two are incompatible. I just don't. I, I'm not sure how to verbalise what that is or what it mm -hmm. should be. I don't know if I'm the right person I, to even do that anyway. I think it would have to be. It's interesting when we speak about what is England as a nation and we kind of start to name quite physical things like we're like oh it's teen biscuits we, we kind of name like ephemera when we're talking yeah. about it um, and I wonder if you want to kind of define what a civic form of nationalism is in England you should appeal to like the liberal tradition in England you should appeal to like the enlightenment thought and like mm. the liberal thinkers in the secular state and um, or well not completely secular state yeah. but the, I'm talking about those enlightenment thinkers yes yeah, yeah. Um, and I wonder if that would be an inclusive, tolerant form of form of nationalism within which multiple cultures can exist. Yeah. Yeah, I guess you go, you know, John Stuart Mill, you go tolerance, you go... I know, like, Scruton in England and Elegy would say uh, it's like, it's institution. Mm -hmm. So, um, <laughs> like the common book of prayer, um, the monarchy the common law, then he would say in like the enchantment of the land, that actually the physical m manifestation of the land of England can be the basis for um, that nationalism. And I, I, I said this to Ava once and she was like, <laughs> so, so he's, so he's just, so he's just plagiarizing romanticism, <laughs> which, which made me laugh. Um, and that, and actually I'd find common ground with that because my, pet political beliefs around agrarian localism and um, communitarianism are, I think, can be a basis um, for that progressive nationalism, right? Because if, if, you are, if, you, if you live a life that is better connected to the land and is better connected to your local community, um, all of it, like the land is literally the country, right? So mm -hmm. if, if the land provides you with your food, your shelter, um, you know, and in the end it provides you with a grave, that's, you could form quite an attachment to that thing mm -hmm. very quickly. And that actually, and I, this is why I think um, a politics, a land-based politics is so important, is because all of these other, you, know, you mentioned ephemera, but like capitalism is ephemera in the, at the end of the day. Like our, our system of government, um, our politics, they are but tears in the rain. <laughs> and... <laughs> and by the end of all of this, whether that's ecological disaster, 
whether we do make it to the eventual heat death of the universe, which remains highly unlikely given how human beings have conducted themselves in the last hundred years, the land will still be there. Mm -hmm. And its permanence can actually be the basis for, I think, a much less atomized and fractured society. I think nationalism is quite inherently romantic because you're appealing to like a kind of utopian or ideal of the nation yeah. that you want to be part of. And I think what else is interesting is you've mentioned capitalism mm. a couple of times and kind of what its role in that in this these riots have been um, and I think part of the oh definitely part of the reason why this anti-immigrant rhetoric is taking hold is because if you look at where these riots have taken place it's often in quite deprived parts of the country and um, if you look at where the reform vote um, took off it was in left behind towns um, and I think when you have economic disenfranchisement, there will it will always be a fertile place for the scapegoating of of migrants. And I think that's because it's it's a simple explanation for why you're mm. not well off. It's one word. It can be deduced into three words. The answer is three words, stop the boats. It's a much simpler, less abstract, um, visible answer to these questions it's a lot easier than explaining the part of the reason for this is there was a political decision to bail out bankers and impose austerity um on the workers and that led to negative in interest rates it's a lot easier than explaining during the pandemic the central banks gave out money to billionaire businesses including elon musk and that allowed massive um share buybacks allowing elon musk to become the richest man in the world that is a lot easier to explain. Or that is a lot more difficult to explain than just, oh, it's migration. It's they're taking your jobs. And that's not an excuse um, for racism or violence or Islamophobia at all. But it does provide the context to understand that there's a vacuum of explanation into which right wing grifters can step. Yeah. And I want to talk, we, we must make a note to talk about Musk. Yeah. Um, and like the civil war stuff and yeah. the role that Twitter is now playing in this. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, okay, so I, so I agree with you. And I want to connect this back to what I was saying about left-wing, um, a left-wing nationalism and the absence of it and how uncompelling it is as projected by Keir Starmer and how it connects to the politics of apathy because essentially you're right to talk about austerity, you're right to talk about the degradation of public services, and this is where it connects to, in my opinion, the entirely legitimate concerns of local communities, where basically the Home Office and the British government has, for a long time now, um, has this policy of dispersal, right? So it distributes uh, people waiting to have their asylum claims processed all around the country, quite often into um, the poorer neighbourhoods of cities and towns. Glasgow is a very good example of this, as, as are other cities. Daniel Trilling's done a lot of good journalism on this. And I believe it to be entirely legitimate and fair that when, if you are um, poor, working class, you live in an area, and particularly in the context of austerity, your public services have been decimated, your council's going bankrupt, and add on to that your fear that you're essentially going to be socially cleansed out of your neighbourhood whether it's by via a process of gentrification, whether it's via a process of um, councils regenerating social social housing, whatever it, whatever it is, and then uh, refugees get moved into your neighbourhood, all of a sudden, even if they represent a very small part of the population, all of a sudden you're going well. I there aren't enough um, there aren't enough houses here for us as it is. I've been on I've been on a waiting list for three years because I've had an extra kid and there's no longer a bedroom. Both my kids sleep in the same room, or we can't get a GP's appointment. Mm -hmm. The library isn't open anymore. It's not racist to say our public services are falling apart already. Mm -hmm. There are more people here wanting to use the public services. You need to do something about that. Yeah. You need to do something about that now. That's austerity. That comes in a much wider context of the neoliberal consensus established by Thatcher, from which no political party has deviated since coming into coming into office. Right? Um, you can track this through turnout, and I think the most important statistic of the general election just gone is the fifty-six percent turnout that we saw. That is appallingly low, appallingly low, and it's part of a process that starts pre-New Labour, 
But if you go if you go back and and people make this mistake, right? Talking about 2019 and the Red Wall, and they describe it as this like um, earthquake, right? That Boris Johnson comes in, a Brexit election, huge sort of convulsion of the electoral system that destroys these Labour heartlands that have been Labour for as long as anyone can remember. That process has been going on for more than 30 years in those constituencies. If you go back and just look at the numbers, and the, the, the important numbers to look at are turnout and the size of the Labour majority. Mm -hmm. And genuinely, it, and it almost, I've, I've I pulled the data for a talk I did the other day. You can, you can take, you know, Blair's constituency, Sedgefield, is actually a very is a is a very good one because it's even though it's the prime minister's seat, the trend mm -hmm. is still there. But Bishop Auckland, um, Bolsover, take take your pick from these these places, and you can see just as the years go on, turnout declines, and um, the the Labour majority shrink starts to shrink and shrink and shrink. And I think the the lessons learned from that, and obviously it's kind of reductive because I'm talking about the entirety of Britain's electoral landscape and boiling it down to one thing, which is that essentially, in my opinion that as the Labour Party moved to the centre, these traditional, industrial, um, to varying degrees, constituencies that voted for a socialist Labour Party are going, what's the point in turning out to vote? Like, if they're moving, mm. the, if they're moving the party to the centre, why would I participate? I don't want to participate in this. Yeah. And Starmer is a continuation of that, yes. that apathy. It's the politics of apathy, bait, right? It, instead of, and the difference with him and, and Blair is that Blair actually kind of had this groundswell of positive support and emotion. Whereas Starmer has gone, we're not them. Mm -hmm. He's defined himself in opposition to a thing and has benefited from the collapse of the Tory vote. Mm -hmm. But in terms of total number of votes, you know, I, I always hesitate to reference this fact because it makes you sound like you're a bleeding heart Corbynite, <laughs> but you know, a smaller popular vote than Corbyn secured. And that is the problem with like employing the politics of apathy. If, you're, if your yeah. strategy for winning elections is essentially turnout's going to be so low because the Tory voters aren't going to turn out. I'm not going to say anything that could possibly alienate anyone. So therefore I won't have a base to turn to, which by the way will be a problem for them when they come to seek a second term. You end up in this place. Mm -hmm. You end up in this place where there is a vacuum that can be filled by some of the worst people. Mm -hmm. It's like it's the deliberate conclusion, though, or endpoint of neoliberalism. Like it, neoliberalism deliberately wants to force a lack of choice between political parties; it just wants one consensus which upholds the order. So apathy is is the end result, like the calculated end result of um, having like a, a neoliberal economy. But again, that's it takes so many more words to explain that, and it's so much less simple. Mm. Um, but I, I also think on economic disenfranchisement and the towns that we saw these riots in, while there was the the crowd psychology of the rioting group rioting for the, expl the explanations you've just gone over, as well as just straight out racism, Islamophobia, whatever, and that's their ideology of the crowd. You can also see the ideology of the crowd in the people that came out the following day to clean up an ideology of community and togetherness mm. and tolerance. Yes. So you have in these communities, you have both at play. It's not just yes. one or the other. But that's what's really interesting to me is that we actually have a very recent example where the kind of atomization of society was undone briefly, where community started to exist again during the pandemic, right? Where you almost spontaneously, all these mutual aid groups start popping up. And whether that's, you know, going and doing the food shop for your elderly neighbor who's shielding and can't go outside you know whatever it is there were these moments where people did organize mm -hmm. those whatsapp groups must still be in existence right the ones that or organize people by street mm -hmm. the, the the facebook groups it's all still that, that infrastructure is still out there mm -hmm. and this is why i don't think it's good enough to say well what do we do you know oh we need we need to go and organize in hartlepool mm -hmm. Well, actually, no, you don't need to go and organise in Hartlepool because unless you're from Hartlepool, there's absolutely no fucking point in going and organising there. Like, mm -hmm. the, peop the people there need to be the ones who are setting up uh, their own groups, whether it's for mutual aid, whether it's for, you know, uh, anti-immigration raids, whether it's for confronting directly the far right. But this is why I find fascinating about this is that the actual infrastructure for facilitating that organization already exists. Um, but
but people have kind of not there was a moment post covid where that mutual aid and that rejuvenated community spirit could have been converted into something political mm -hmm. and it hasn't been mm. can we circle back because i when we're talking about protests i i posed the question about whether or not we would describe these people as domestic terrorists yes and we didn't get there mm. and i'd quite like to talk about that yeah so first of all do you think do you think terrorism is a useful phrase phraseology do you think it's uh i think terrorism is an interesting word because it it is associated with uh, a moral value. So like terrorism is an inherently bad thing. I think a lot of people use the term political violence because it, it has less um, connotations, positive or negative connotations. It's a more neutral word. Less pejorative. Yes. Um, but I think it depends. Yeah, I think you could, if you're just, if you're taking terrorism to mean violence with a political end then yes i would say that it's terrorism i don't want to like turn this into a like a epistemological debate about what terrorism means uh because so often and that's why i said pejorative because this is quite often it's just a phrase we use to describe um like political violence conducted by our enemies right so yeah if you're an irish republican or if you're a Muslim, uh, and that's kind of why it's been cheapened, right? Because yeah. oodles and oodles of lone wolf attackers in the United States are like mental health, mental health um, failures, lone wolf attacker versus if a Muslim does it, it's like, this is a terror attack, um, which demonstrates why I think it's an unhelpful word. But mm -hmm. I, I agree with you, right? Okay, so if we essentially say it's violence for a political end, then there is no other way to frame this, right? It is far-right racists smashing up mosques mm -hmm. and uh, the architecture and infrastructure that we have in this country <laughs> limited in its scope mm -hmm. to facilitate asylum seekers. Mm -hmm. That's violence for political ends. There is no other mm -hmm. way to describe it if that's the case. Yeah, and, and they, ex they we explicitly know what their political ends are because they tweet about it. They're chanting about it at the riots and um, they're saying stop the boats and yeah. um, end immigration and um, we can see it in the symbols they attack as well yeah and and actually interestingly right Farage uh, in the wake of Southport with his just asking questions um, bit he it's like is this terror related you know we, 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 we don't we don't know because um, those little girls they were white and and from what I'm hearing, this guy, not white. Is it a security issue? I don't know, just asking questions. Which I find is is like the lexicon of... Well, it's, it's kind of Trumpian, but it's also... Um, it's like the lexicon of the alt-right yeah, like, online. And it, but the, the it's like, yeah, Nigel, um, it has about as much... It has about as much credence or weight to it, legitimacy. It has the, asking that question has as much legitimacy as me saying, is Nigel Farage a nonce? <laughs> it has absolutely no, but neither proposition has any basis in fact. Mm -hmm. But if I say, is Nigel Farage, Farage a nonce? I don't know. I'm just asking the question. I'm just, it's a legitimate question. Mm -hmm. Is he? Is he? No, mm -hmm. it's not a legitimate question mm -hmm. because there's no evidence to suggest otherwise. Mm -hmm. You don't just get to say, I'm going to ask a question yeah. about this and therefore it is legitimate. Yeah, I mean, it was classic populist rhetoric is to undermine and erode trust in democratic institutions, mm. um, which is exactly what he was doing by asking those questions. And I'd argue that he knew that very well. <laughs> um, and well, yeah, and legitimate, by the way, but like law around court reporting, around protecting the identity of, yeah. of minors. And it, I don't know the reason that the judge has lifted the reporting restrictions on it, but it is almost certainly, quite possibly, mm -hmm. I should say, because of these like this swirling tornado yeah. about his identity. And they've kind of gone, well, he's nearly 18. Yes. We, need yeah. to, we need to get ahead of this. Because yeah. He was going to turn 18 within the course of the trial, I think. Yeah. So they lifted the restrictions. But Nigel Farage would have known that. And also, if he did have genuine questions, he could have asked them in the House. But he chose to put them on Twitter instead. Um, what do you think of Nigel Farage's kind of silence over the weekend? And then... He's not someone that's afraid to do the media around, mm. usually, but he's responded with a letter which he published yesterday. And I wonder what, what do you make of that? Yeah, I don't think reform have put anyone up for anything. 
Um, Tice was on GB News this morning. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. You watched that over your cornflakes, do you? <laughs> GB News. Watched it on the tube, and I was quite like, <laughs> what will people think of me? <laughs> people looking over your shoulder. Yeah, here's, there's, here's, here's us talking about like anti fascist action. If you see someone watching GB News, what are you going to do? <laughs> you know. Um, right, yeah, so the, it's a political conundrum uh, for them. Tice, by the way, when, when the original unrest in Southport happened, he put out a tweet that was like, this, the, the law needs to rain down on these people. Um, I think knowingly sort of getting ahead of where's the condemnation, where's the, the denunciation of what's happening. Uh, Hannah Arendt, right, uh, on the origins of totalitarianism, the alliance between the elite and the mob. That is what you're seeing between reform. It's not, co uh, to be clear, it's not explicitly like party political. It's not coordinated at that level. But when we look at characters like Farage, uh, Suella, um, Lee Anderson, so back when he was, he was a Tory at the time when he said that Sadiq Khan was running London with his Islamist mates. Mm -hmm. Now he's in reform. By the way, in terms of Suella, right, um, in, in invasion, um, this is really important, going back to the Gaza protests, mm -hmm. calling them hate marches. Yep. I spoke, I, di I, di I did um, phone-ins on this on LBC, right? And I spoke to people relentlessly when I was saying at the time, I don't think it's a hate march if you're calling for a ceasefire. I think it's a hate march if you're in the far right turning out to, I can't remember what even their justification was at that time, protect the cenotaph to, to like pay their respect, oh, whatever the fuck it was. I know which of those two marches was hateful and I think it's probably the one that was doing the Nazi salutes. And you would get people calling in and you could tell from their, their complaint that it wasn't so much about um, whether or not there should be an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. Mm -hmm. The problem they had was that they were deeply uncomfortable, I would say scared, by the mass mobilization of a multi-ethnic crowd right it's because and this is this connects to the politics of protest and, mm -hmm. and protest as street theater mm -hmm. because essentially what is what is the dynamic of a protest you're mm -hmm. saying to whatever it is you're trying to challenge look if it comes down to it we can organize 300,000 people to come out on the street like it's essentially a, you're flexing your muscles almost right and yes you're calling for you're calling for change, you're calling for whatever political cause you have. But at the end of the day, in terms of like real politique, that is what you're doing. You're, you're like, we are here, we are many. Mm -hmm. Listen to us all. The impl it's implied, right? These 300,000 people could be doing something else that's not peaceful. And the fear, and it wasn't about, um, it wasn't about Gaza. It was about basically like the, in the, that they'd like lost the capital to Muslims, mm -hmm. basically. Mm. And that there was, and this is a phrase you'll hear over and over again now. Uh, you see it on Telegram. You hear it from Tommy Robinson and his right-hand man, Danny Tomo, Daniel Thomas, who um, incited what happened in Southport um, with a YouTube video, which he's since deleted, but is still available on Searchlight. Um, I've lost my train of thought there. What was I talking Oh, yeah. The, essentially, there's this two-tier policing between like yeah. them and us. And it essentially works to the political advantage of the elites to form this alliance with the mob who are out committing these acts because it's been politically um, expedient for them to do so. Mm -hmm. Again, this connects to Starmer. And if you don't provide an alternative political vision, if you don't tell a story, a positive mm -hmm. story about hope and about love when it comes to refugees, mm -hmm. you will never be... you like. You're pan at, at the most extreme end of it, you are pandering to these people. Mm -hmm. And if you're not pandering to those people, specifically you're pandering people who have sympathy with those yeah. people. When you say, um, we're not gonna do Rwanda, but we are going to you know, deport people to third countries. When, if, you, if you don't say, no, actually these people have a, have a valued and important contribution to make to mm -hmm. our society and we will welcome them with open arms. Mm -hmm. And you instead say, these people are a threat, it is a problem. You're pandering to those people. And it mm -hmm. connects to what I was saying about the politics of apathy. Um, and the reason I think reform have not been out and about mm -hmm. talking about this is because they are essentially hamstrung. Yeah. These people vote for reform. Mm -hmm. You hear it in the videos, you see it on social media, you see 
Um, Tommy Robinson was was tweeting during the general election campaign at Nigel Farage, at Nigel, at Richard Tice, let us into your party, right? Yeah. Um, they, you hear them chant like amongst um, Oh Tommy Tommy, like about Nigel, about reform. Four million people voted for reform in the general election. I'm not, by no stretch, I'm not, I want to be absolutely clear, I'm not suggesting they all have far-right sympathies or tendencies. Um, but if he comes out and disavows what is happening, he, A, looks weak because he, he pandered to them and played into their hands with his opening piece and therefore risks alienating his ba base. Um, but B, it's also a bit of a legal minefield for them. Because in the same way that I mentioned that, that Danny Tomo guy, who has an interesting criminal record, by the way, worth checking out, 2016 charges that he, that, that he was convicted of. Um, like, there are open questions now about literally inciting a riot. Like, mm. th that's, not, that's not small beer. Mm -hmm. And if you look at what happened in 2011 to people who were underage, right, that they were, that were judged to be the sort of ringleaders of that mm -hmm. law, civil unrest, Multiple year long prison sentences. Mm -hmm. These guys are, are not minors. Yeah. Um, now, I'm not suggesting that Farage has, has committed any crimes or Danny Tomo for what it's worth. You know, it'll be, it's for the justice system to decide that. Um, and I'm sure both men would protest their innocence. Mm. But politically, he's, Farage and reform are basically between a rock and a hard place. And I think also just in terms of the, like, the theater of an interview. It's they know that they anywhere they go is just going to be. Well, you said this in your video, Nigel. Why yeah. did you say? Why did you say that? Or was it right for Nigel to say that? Like mm -hmm. it's, it's just going to be them getting a shellacking and sort of implied culpability for what's happening. Yeah. So from a completely cynical like, optics, political communications, management perspective, I don't think they'll do it. But I also think politically they're kind of trapped. What do you think? Um, I agree, and I, I think the two tier policing line which Nigel was pushing in his letter which is that I condemn the violence but um, I think is interesting I think this two-tier policing thing and this goes back to Twitter and Twitter's amplification and role in this if we have time to talk about that yeah we do um, I'll go all day on this <laughs> one, I'll go all day I think um, this two-tier policing thing is really interesting because I think it's it, it's, verg it's verging on conspiracy and um, and I actually think that it's showing the dividing line between reform and the conservatives. And I actually think Priti Patel has been very strong on this. She was speaking, I think it was to Times Radio. And she said, it's, she condemned Nigel Farage. She criticized him. She said, it's not two tier policing. What you had with the pro Palestine marches was people, or with Black Lives Matter to that, um, in the same vein, you had people legitimately protesting and um, voicing their opinions and occupying space, which that is protest. Mm. What you have with what's happening now is violence and criminal damage. And she said, of course, those two things are going to be policed differently because they are fundamentally two different things. Mm. It's not the group or the crowd, it's their actions that are different. And that's why they're being policed different. Yeah. And um, she's right. <laughs> she is. Slay pretty. <laughs> um, but. Okay, so, uh, so yes, right. In, in its current iteration, the riots versus those protests, they're policed differently because they're different things. Mm -hmm. And actually, that logic and that explanation can be applied to the previous protests from which this two-tier policing thing started because the, the, the most recent but explicit example, but they've been saying it for years, um, was on the Armistice Day stuff yep. where they were basically saying after the far right went, had a tear up, loads of them got nicked. They were like, this is two-tier policing. Why Why is it that the Muslims are able to march through London and don't get arrested, but when we're here, the police are all in riot gear? And it's it's quite simple. Um, like, the, the Gaza ceasefire marches aren't as aggressive to the police no. as, as these guys are. And by the way, in terms of their number, hundreds of thousands of them, I'm not, I'm not trying to minimize um, you know, the anti-Semitism that some people have been arrested and charged with at those marches. Mm -hmm. As a proportion of the people attending, the arrest rate is something similar to Glastonbury yeah. Festival. Um, I've been at these far-right marches. Mm -hmm. I've reported on them. They attack the police. Mm -hmm. 
They attack journalists. Mm-hmm. I've watched the, I've watched a reporter have his nose broken in front of me. One of the one of my a good friend of mine, someone who used to work, he got assaulted when we were working at one of those marches. They are aggressive. They are dangerous. Um, I don't know a great deal about public order policing, mm. but I know that where possible, the police try not to have a heavy-handed yeah. presence yeah. at mobilizations and events like that mm-hmm. because the police can actually end up becoming a target. Yes. Right. So if you have an otherwise peaceful march progressing down, I don't know, embankment. Mm-hmm. And then at the end of embankment, there's 500 police in riot gear. Mm-hmm. It doesn't really matter what's happened before. If you're on the, at the front of that march, you only really interpret that as one thing, which is like, oh, fuck, we're about to get filled in yeah. by the police here. Mm-hmm. So the police have to be very careful about the way they manage these things. But there comes a point when you're getting already what would probably constitute drunken, drunken disorder mm-hmm. with these guys, because by the way, a lot of them are just on the piss. Drug use as well. You're already getting sort of like petty criminality before they even start throwing things at the cops, yeah. throwing bottles at the cops, throwing bricks at the cops. Um, and so it's different. And, and just for what it's worth, like if you want to talk about two-tier policing, any of you, then I would just humbly ask you to engage with... Um, the Casey Review and Report and others, which have relentlessly, routinely found that yes, the Met is institutionally racist. I'm gonna gonna let you in a little secret. It's not racist towards white people, (laughs) okay? Um, As well as it's it's latent homophobia, sexism as well. Like, uh, yeah, I agree with you. There is two-tier policing. No one who spent any time investigating it, thinking about Mm -hmm. it, writing, reporting, and investigating it thinks Mm -hmm. that it's white people that are dealt with unfairly by the police. And it's worth, being specific, um, that report was into the Metropolitan Police, but those issues have been found routinely throughout other police forces in the mm-hmm. country as well. And mm-hmm. um, the the policing towards crowds in the UK is is facilitative policing. So they ask, what are the legitimate goals of the crowd, and how can we facilitate? those legitimate goals which is whether they want to march through the centre of London they want to occupy a space the police aren't seeking to be combative or stop the legitimate goals of the crowd but what you have in Southport in Hartlepool in Liverpool um, with these rioters um, is illegitimate and the police will of course seek to stop you from looting, from smashing up shops that are owned by minority ethnic groups. Of course, they're they're not going to c- facilitate criminality. Mm. Um, uh, we mentioned Twitter there. Yeah, should we do Musk? Yeah. What What do you think Elon Musk's role is in all of this? <laughs> um. Well, it, somewhat bizarrely, it's actually significant. Um, because since he bought Twitter. Mm-hmm. The volume, uh, the proliferation of far right content is well, it's gone fucking bananas. Mm-hmm. Um, whether that's sort of like top level stuff, so reinstating accounts, yeah, um, Tommy Robinson being the obvious one, real name Stephen Yaxley Lennon, Tate. Andrew Tate. There are other minor, more minor sort of far right, alt right online figures yeah. who are also banned from there. Um, There are worlds in which, under its previous ownership model, I think the content moderation teams would very quickly have taken down some of the videos um, put out by, I don't want to name names, Mm -hmm. just for legal reasons, but certain videos that got put out around the riots that you could possibly say were either incitement, misinformation. I mean, the information ecosystem in this is really interesting because the sort of uh, Katie Hopkins said that fake Muslim name that came from that Channel 3 News, yeah. which John Sweeney was saying at, saying to me at the weekend, is a Russian website. I, I don't check that out, but I'd take his word for it. Um, that disinformation, the way it spiraled, that have kind of led, in a way, to the mosque getting attacked, as well as the pretty sincere, deeply held racism of the people involved. It's not just the misinformation, right? Like mm-hmm. That triggered them off, but the long-term yes. cause is that they thought it already. So... That information is there, like, and previously, don't get me, don't get me wrong. I think there's, I think there's a select, there's a, there's a slightly selective aspect to a lot of journalists when they, when they, and they overemphasize, I think, the role that Twitter has played in this. Don't get me wrong, it has played a role, but that it's almost like because they're on Twitter and they now see this content, 
mm-hmm. that they're like, oh my God, people are consuming far right content. If you've been on, if you, you don't have to go very far on Telegram to find the channels where all of this stuff that was get, that's now yeah. being posted on Twitter was being posted yeah. there for years. Yes. With, I mean, the Tommy's Telegram that I think the biggest one has more than 100,000 people yeah. in. Like all the content's mm-hmm. there. Um, so that that's part of it. Then there's when Musk replies to or interacts with a tweet. Uh, there's plenty of there's plenty of people out there who've done the done the research on this. I've forgotten the guy's Twitter account now, so I feel really bad. I'll see if I can pull it up when you talk next. But he basically when Musk interacts with a tweet, it just goes, mm. it explodes, right? Yeah, that could be because when Musk took over Twitter, he changed the algorithm so that more people saw his tweets. Um, because it's he, kind of what I would do if I owned Twitter. It'd well, be like, well, surely I'm just going to like 100x everything I post. <laughs> yeah, um, I, it was because he was annoyed that the US president's tweet, uh, tweets were getting more interaction than his as the CEO of Twitter. Um, so change the algorithm so we all saw his tweets more. Um, but I think that's interesting because you're, you're right in like these things aren't starting on Twitter. They're starting in these Telegram channels and WhatsApp groups and then being amplified um, on Twitter by people that were formerly banned from Twitter. Um, but it's interesting because Elon Musk's argument would be, well, this is this is free speech. This is a free speech platform. So I'm, therefore I'm going to allow these formerly banned, cancelled men back on my, my, usually men, sometimes women, back on my, um, <laughs> back on my uh, platform. But it's interesting because if you actually look at free speech on Twitter, um, governments can like pose takedown requests to Twitter um, and then it's up to Twitter to decide whether to comply with them and take down the posts that they, they want taken down or not. And accepted takedown requests from governments have gone up since Elon Musk took over Twitter. So that's more censorious than it was before. Mm. But I guess he's just, it's being censored in a different way. Yes. Yeah, look, I, this comes back to our conversation about, about tolerance, right? Mm-hmm. Um, are you a free speech absolutist, as Musk claims to be? Do you believe that there is um, that hate speech should be excluded? You know, how do we categorize? So right, so previously, and um, I think it's I think it's Flat Earth News, the sort of um, tabloid analysis that talks about how the Daily Mail, in its crime reporting for decades, and the photo desk and the way they literally yeah. like put the stories together overrepresented people from ethnic minority backgrounds in their crime reporting, right? So at the, at the time, they rep, uh, black and ethnic minority people represent between 10 and 15% of the British population, but they make up something like more than half of the photos used mm. to sit alongside their crime reporting, right? And this is given as an example of a way in which media can influence either intentionally and explicitly or subliminally um, people's attitudes in this instance towards racism and xenophobia and that book is quite wide, widely read people understand it and it's a conscious decision when people are now making report when people are putting newspapers together doing their journalism reporting about in the whole how are we achieving balance how are we representing communities different groups of people across the breadth of our coverage um, there are twitter accounts that you can go on at much like there are Telegram channels, and all they do is post like videos of, of crimes being committed by black and ethnic minority mm-hmm. people. They then um, pull in thousands, tens of thousands of engagements, the locus of which is questionable. Uh, I think you would, I don't think you have to be a genius to work out that if we're talking about like information war and information system destabilization, that a hostile foreign power, for example, Russia, has an interest in amplifying content like that. And all of a sudden that account, which might just be like a random like far right guy in his mum's basement, is essentially a useful idiot for, for mm-hmm. Kremlinist propaganda. And again, I want to be clear, I'm not like a big like Russia is fucking with us everywhere we look Brexit was fake yada 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 but if that if if just from like a information information destabilization perspective if you have this platform where you can essentially amplify content mm-hmm. that will sort of activate racist thoughts and beliefs yeah. in a population I mean sh- surely you're doing that right 
Yeah. If you've got, if you've got a bot farm, if you've got a click farm where you can artificially boost this stuff, you would do that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and it's happening at the same time that there's been an erosion of trust in mainstream media. Yes. So you've got these two things happening simultaneously. And um, what did you, I guess the kind of tweet that started this um, Elon Musk versus Starmer um, conflict is Musk said that replied to a comment of um, rioters setting off fireworks at the police and said that civil war is inevitable. What what did you make of that? Um, I think he's dumb. Obviously, uh, I don't. I don't think a civil war is inevitable. I mean, that's, it's like in like two weeks' time, it's like getting fucking clipped up, and being <laughs> like these idiots. <laughs> um, you know, we're not quite at like full on race war just yet. I mean, I think it's <laughs> it's actually interesting because I think Keir Starmer has been really careful in the language he's used to frame the violence we've seen, and I think what we were talking about with is this terrorism is this political violence how do you frame it Keir Starmer has been really really clear in his framing of this as criminality like even the use of the words like thuggery like he's very much portraying this as a minority of individuals committing criminal acts which I think is quite a smart decision because it's not lending them legitimacy as a political movement it's condemning them to being thugs and criminals and also that using that language dictates the response as well, which is why we're seeing the response as um, supporting police, supporting the criminal justice system, as opposed to calls to bring in the army, like we saw from Farage, Mm -hmm. um, which would also lend more credence to Elon Musk's framing of civil war. Um, So I think Starmer's response is very calculated. Yeah, look, Britain is not America. No. You know, and if this was happening there then I would kind of have, like, concerns. But even the last time it fully booted off, right, post-George Floyd, yeah, they didn't get to a civil war. It was bad, mm-hmm. but it wasn't full-on civil war vibes. I think... I, I would challenge what you just said there mm. about treating this as criminality and crime. Mm. I think what you're seeing here is... You, this is Starmer, the prosecutor, yeah. right? This is, this is um, law and order... Yeah. You've committed a crime. We will prosecute you. Yeah. You will face the full force of the law. Mm-hmm. Which, by the way, he has form for uh, in the wake of the 2011 riots. The speed and the strength of the convictions um, that followed as a result of that. Mm-hmm. A lot still. They, I mean, they were at the time, but there still are questions about the kind of um, the fairness and the appropriateness of some of the sentences that were handed down because what happened during 2011. And Starmer was a key key architect of it in yeah. some instances as well. You know, we're talking about like remanding in custody children and, and yeah. stuff like that. And that's fine. You mm-hmm. know, that's uh, one way of dealing with this. I, however, do not think it's enough. I think you, he is mm-hmm. not just the director of public prosecutions anymore. Yeah. He's the prime minister and he's a politician and he's a leader. Yeah. And what that means is he has to... It sounds like a juvenile way of putting it. He has to tell a story about what's yeah. happening. Yeah. And this is kind of, again, where it gets to with the politics of apathy again. Whereas if you treat this as a technocrat and you go civil unrest, authoritarian justice policy, activate, tick, bang. Okay, fine. So you're going to put, I think there's you know nearly 400 people have been arrested. So <laughs> if there's space in the prisons, yeah. <laughs> that are where people are going to end up. Um that's part of it, but essentially, if you, if you again, if you abandon the the, the sort of um, the narrative terrain, and you don't talk about why this is happening, yep. um, the concerns of the people involved, and again, I'm not legitimising the sort of uh, the far right tendencies, but if you don't tell a tell a story about immigration, if you don't tell a story about um, the sort of the destruction of the public realm, and you just keep wanging on about duty and politics as a mm-hmm. service. You're in very, very dangerous territory. Yeah. Very dangerous territory. And I think I think that's something he has to only he can do actually. Yeah. As the Prime Minister. I I actually think in a way, um, it's sort of you can you can leave the Home Secretary to do the as has traditionally been yeah. the mechanism of um cabinets in this country, is the Home Secretary does the law and order stuff. Yeah. And the Prime Minister can can sort of tell the story about it. Um 
do you think he you know he had he, in the campaign he was talking about like how he wanted to keep Friday nights for his for his family <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you think they were having a nice Friday night dinner while Southport was burning <laughs> on holiday no um, I, I think, think he's meant to go on holiday yeah he was meant to be I, I don't think, think that's going to happen no <laughs> I think the the framing of it as criminal is de-escalatory in the moment in terms of not right. increasing tensions yeah but you're right in that it's it's not a long-term solution. It's again, it's putting a lid on it and not addressing it, and just saying and then trying to just move on. Mm. But it, ultimately, it'll just bubble over again if you don't actually address it. And the response from his to his remarks from, well, Elon and also Tommy. Elon, I think, took issue with um, Starmer had said something about like protecting mosques, yep. and he was like, "What about all communities?" Yep, yep. Which is. <laughs> A real like all lives matter moment yeah. <laughs> from, from Elon Musk um, and Tommy was like pathetic um, you know, but he was having an issue with like the framing of it as far right basically mm. um, <laughs> which again uh, any of these commentators any of these and to, admittedly a lot of them have kind of backtracked on this now to do the whole um, it's not far right I don't understand what what vocabulary can you use to describe what's happening? Mm-hmm. Um, if it's not that, it's, uh, it's a they're, they're burning down hotels with asylum seekers in it. Yeah, that tells you everything you need to know. It does. I think we've. Well, I think we've. I think we've set the world to yeah, rights. It was quite there. exhaustive, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Yeah, <laughs> I think we've set the world to right there. To, to rights there, Laura Beveridge. Hmm. Um, what's that? More than an hour. Jeez. Well over an hour. Yeah. It's a lot, but it was a long weekend. <laughs> yeah, it was a long weekend. Do we think there'll be more? Are we going to have to do this again in a week later? It'll be like Laura and Ollie special, more riots. Well, if you believe what's circulating online, maybe. Yeah. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. <laughs> <laughs> um... Don't Laura. Know how optimistic Is this it was. the first one that's just been you and me? I think so. The um, last time I was on, it was the first one that was just me and Ed, <laughs> which was quite nice. Someone mm. said it was like devolution at the, <laughs> <laughs> at the Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it is. Okay. Well, I don't know how, if that was devolution, I don't know what this would be, but I've loved it. Uh, thank you for talking to me. Thank you for bringing your insights, your knowledge, uh, your analysis. Thank you. Greatly appreciated. Bye. Bye. <laughs>